Hello everybody, you're listening to the Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host Dane Cobain. This is the weekly radio show where we chat about the local arts news. We have a different guest on each week. We head over to the Rye Light Zone for a short story and or some poetry. We catch up with Twanglin' Jack Ford in the Oak Shed for a weekly album review. And we play local unsigned and or independent music. As always, you can find us on Facebook. If you search for the Arch Show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. And we are repeat on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again, iTunes, Spotify and wherever else you get your podcasts. Please do leave us a short review on your podcast platform of choice. It all helps. You can also find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound. And you can reach out to me here on the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. So this week we are going to be chatting to horror author Gloria McNeely. But before we do that, we are going to head over to the Rye Light Zone and catch up with A.B. Frank for some more of his flash fiction. The foreman's voice echoed between the cranes and off the factory wall where I was about to repair the ship. It was the call on, and the shouts of men suggested he'd toss the tokens on the floor for the dockers to fight over. That is the nature of working on the docks. The scent of spices and alcohol wafted into the factory, reminding me I was hungry, but would spend most of my wages in the alehouse after my shift. I strolled through the corridors of the faulty ship, toolbox in hand, wishing I didn't have to put my aching body through such manual work. Some cargo had been left behind. The rules were clear in this situation. Take what you could carry for yourself, and don't get caught. Clear, but not specifically written anywhere. I wasn't about to break those rules. I put my hand on the pallet of forgotten goods and was transported to the open ocean during a storm. It was like I was reliving the harrowing memory of the ship's last voyage, in which it was damaged. The crew were hauling the cargo from the water while rain peppered their faces, but long, slimy limbs reached from the water onto the deck and wrestled the men for the cargo. The captain discharged his revolver into the pale limbs and they withdrew to whence they came. The crew members that had been in direct contact with the limbs screamed and bled. They took no notice of the help offered by the medic. One by one, they ran across the deck, hauling themselves overboard. I left the factory immediately, never to return. Workbenches were covered in blood spatter. My tools for hacking and cutting were close to hand. I sharpened a meat cleaver while I waited for that morning's meat delivery. The carcasses arrived and were suspended from hooks before I butchered them into portions. As I worked through them, slicing and segmenting, I came across the most peculiar of animals. I certainly hadn't ordered the unidentified beast, and how it came to be suspended in my butchers was a mystery. I studied it. The meat had the richest red colour, and plenty of it. I sliced myself a sample to take home, as I often do, with the intention of selling the remaining food instead of returning it. I was hooked by the savoury fragrance as it cooked, and the texture as I chewed. That night, my sleep was broken and restless. Nightmares plagued me, and I repeatedly woke sweating. The following day, my urges started. To begin with, I had a need to eat raw meat. After I had submitted to this shameful thought, it progressed to a need to eat the meat of something still living. I have no doubt that my change came from that strange animal's sullied carcass. I have kept someone prisoner in the basement of my butchers for the terrible moment an urge arises. I do not know if this nightmare will end before I bring an end to it with the tools I am so accustomed to using on the flesh of animals. I climb the narrow staircase in the bookshop. Used tomes bound in leather occupied every available space. Word had reached me that the volume I so desperately sought was in this store. The volume that was rightfully mine. Stolen in the most peculiar of circumstances. Stolen before I could attempt the ritual. I clutched the scrap of paper like my life depended on it. It was the only piece of the book that I retained, and I would use it to identify the book as my own. I strained my eyes in the dim candlelight and began my search. My nose twitched when I disturbed the dust on the dark wooden shelves. Crouching down to the bottom shelf, I moved some forgotten books and recognised the spine of my volume immediately. Placing it down on the small table kicked up another cloud of dust that I waved away. I flicked through the pages with care, and there it was. The page that had consumed me from afar for all these years. 
the instructional diagram, torn in half, was before me. My knuckles were white, gripping the other half of the page safely in my palm. The two halves joined perfectly, despite the jagged tear. The strange symbols seemed to take on a life of their own, almost becoming three-dimensional. A strong breeze circulated around the room and the pages fluttered. I was finally ready to finish my work. I needed a sturdy place to act as a base when I was hunting deep in the woods. But it was proving to be a difficult job. Rain hammered down, making the task all the more arduous. The clay and rain mixed in murky pools at the bottom of the hole I'd been digging. I fought for a strong foothold in the slimy clay so I could finish clearing the earth for my subsurface shelter. The clay had not behaved as I expected it to. I'd experienced clay in the past and this was not responding the way it should. With every slab that my shovel cut away, it shimmered and almost regenerated entirely before I could move more material. I fancied I was dehydrated from the manual labour and that that was causing me to see things that were not happening. However, any notion that it was all in my head was soon to be dismissed when the rain subsided. My vision was no longer impaired by rain streaming into my eyes. I saw sections of the clay begin to writhe as though something lived just beneath the surface. Something that had been dormant, woken by my actions. The clay climbed past my ankle and tightened. I freed myself and ran, leaving my boot behind in the mouth of the clay. I can never visit the woods again. I await the day when the woods pays me a visit to finish what it intended to do that day. My master routinely stared out of the dining room window with his morning tea. He'd say the view of the rolling hills made him feel reborn. Watching the leaves shimmer on the trees and the occasional deer grazing was indeed lovely. I'd even steal a few moments to appreciate the land before returning to my household tasks. But this changed the day my master spotted the mist on the hill. Good heavens, he said, come and have a look at this. He pointed to a spot where a lone cylindrical patch of mist rested on the pack horse track that led to a local farm. Before our eyes, its edges softened and it faded away. I've never seen mist behave that way. I must investigate this at once. He buttoned up his shirt, swung an overcoat on and left. I'd walked up that pack horse track before. The farmer's son blocked the path and was most unwelcoming to a lady. One way street this is, he said. Won't be able to go back down. The guard dogs snarled and barked from their cages up by the farmhouse. And for those reasons, I have no desire to revisit that place. But myself and the rest of the staff are worried about our master. The sun has now set at the end of the second day since his departure. He has not returned to the manor since that morning. The mayor of Vileshire rested in his coach, dead centre of the convoy. The three locomotives had left the city and moved along a dirt track through the ever-thickening foliage. A tree lay across the track, forcing the coachmen to rein in the horses. Obstruction in the road, called the first coachman. The mayor opened the door to help, but... Glancing at the muddy ground, ordered the other drivers to move it. A group of men filtered from behind trees and onto the track like the breeze blowing over the bracken. Their faces hidden as they moved with the efficiency of experienced thieves. The convoy were caught with their guard down, preoccupied with the fallen tree. You're the highwaymen of Vileshire, said the coachman, raising his hands in surrender. We're men, and we're on a highway, replied one of the highwaymen from behind his black face covering. We're here to uphold the highwayman's code. He opened the door of the mayor's carriage. We need to see your papers. Papers, replied the mayor. We have permits to undertake business on behalf of the city. My men all have their licenses. The highwayman nodded to two of his men, and they hauled the mayor from his seat into the dirt. We need to see your paper, money, valuables and the like, said the highwayman. Please cooperate with us and you'll be on your way before you know it, albeit on foot. The highwayman approached the driver of the rear coach and placed a hand on his shoulder. Right on time. Thank you for the information. He slit his throat with a blade concealed in his sleeve. 
Big thank you to AB Frank for this week's entry into the Rylight Zone. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is San Dimas with Wait and Wonder.
that was Colorblind by Tom Bradley Jr. And before that, we had Wait and Wonder by San Dimas. You're listening to the Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. And it's time for us to be joined now by this week's guest, who is horror author Gloria McNeely. Well, the first question is one, it's a traditional question, my traditional opening question. Um, but it's one that all of the writers always have a good answer for. And I'm sure you will as well. It's what was the last book that you read and what did you think of it? Ooh, can I remember the last book that I read? Um, <laughs> the last book that I finished, I think, was uh, Where I End by Sophie White. Yeah. And it actually just won a Shirley Jackson Award as well. And I'm still thinking about it. Uh, it's It absolutely made my skin crawl and freaked me out. And unearthed emotions I didn't think I had anymore. So <laughs> uh, an absolutely fantastic book. Yeah, just something... Uh, very unexpected and also set in Ireland so it felt very close to home as well so I definitely recommend that one cool well one of the questions I wanted to ask you uh, as well in terms of Irish writers who are some of your your favorite Irish writers yeah so uh, (laughs) not to be a broken record but Sophie White is a contemporary one that I definitely I love all of her books Um, obviously going back obviously there's Oscar Wilde and Bram Stoker Mm. and uh, I've been reading a lot of short stories by Sheridan Le Fanu recently as well Um, we do have some some uh, contemporary uh, horror writers as well because I'm a horror writer I always Mm -hmm. try and look for those but um, I'm very much in the, the literary scene in Dublin as well so a lot of the the writers that I see are speculative fiction writers or um, literary writers. Uh, Wendy Erskine is one who's from Belfast. She's a fantastic, really funny short story writer. Um, Yeah, and I think think that's about it. I mean, uh, Sarah Marie Griffin uh, is another one. who writes some YA stuff, some sort of fantasy writing that I really like. Um, Obviously, Sally Rooney is one that's Mm. more widely known. Um, She does a lot of great uh, literary fiction books. So we're we're lucky here. We have a a great base for writing, and I think there's a great uh, hunger for more writers and more innovative writing as well. Yeah, for sure. Well, and it's funny, you know, you're mentioning the different genres. I, I can't remember where it was now, but I once heard it said that uh, horror and romance are the two genres where they kind of creep into other genres. So you can have horror in a fantasy novel or, um, you know, even like a contemporary no- novel or a thriller or whatever it is without it actually turning it into a horror novel whereas you know with something like fantasy as soon as you start adding fantasy elements it kind of becomes a fantasy novel whether whether you want it to or not yeah but i i definitely do find that there's there's horror in pretty much everything i mean real life is horror a lot of the (laughs) time so when i i interact with a lot of literary fiction writers they they always sort of take a step back and say they don't know how to handle horror writing but but then I read one of their stories and it's one of the most horrific stories I've ever read, just set in, you know, realism. And in today's yeah. world, they just don't consider it horror. So I definitely think that you can look at any kind of story and you can find horror elements in it because we're all sort of motivated by fear as much as we are love. So there's definitely got to be some of that in almost every story, I think. Yeah, it's kind of how you you can't have the light without the darkness sort of thing. And well, I, I wanted because I wanted to ask you, um, and I'm I'm going to lead you in slightly here with with my comments. But um, I wanted to ask you what your favorite Stephen King book is and why. Um, but the reason I, I'm thinking this now as well is because I think that's one of the things he does quite well. Like if you look at something like Misery, uh, with Annie the character the, as a character in that, there's there's like no supernatural elements or anything like that that people might think it's not a ghost story it's not a monster story or anything like that it's literally just the horror of one person to another and and i think that's kind of again that's that's what's scary about life is that that horror really is out there i think that's scarier to me than you know monsters under the bed or anything um but yeah so so uh, what is your favorite stephen king book um yeah i think I think for me, it would 
probably be Firestarter. I have, yeah. I've always sort of loved, um, you know, being being a little girl growing up reading fantasy and stuff. I, I've always sort of loved the idea of having this young female character mm. and also um, like telekinesis and just being able to do things with the strength of your own mind, I thought was always cool. But definitely for Stephen King stories, he always does have some, or he doesn't always, but a lot of the times he does have some sort of a, a monster or a supernatural element, but they tend to work through uh, mm. a human person and just sort of lean a little bit on the human potential for violence and for going crazy and for doing these wild things. And a lot of the time they don't even really need to to lean that hard. So. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely a lot of a lot of stories of his that like misery that just it's all about the the person and it's all about what we are unfortunately capable of. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and again, like as you were saying there, like The Shining is a great example of that, where it does have that supernatural entity, but it's the the character themselves is really uh you know the vehicle they act through, and I guess maybe like the dark half as well is it kind of comes to mind. Um, but yeah, Firestarter is great as well. I, I I love that novel too. So awesome. Um, and so we should talk about your writing. Uh, how long have you been writing and, and how did you get your start? Oh, Lord. Um, well, I've technically, I guess, been writing since I could lift a pen. Um, mm -hmm. I have notebooks of little stories I was writing when I was uh, like five or six years old. Um, it's just always kind of been like in the back of my mind it was never you know when you're you're a kid you imagine like oh I'm going to be a firefighter I'm going to be a <laughs> pop star whatever but it was always just like I'm going to write that's just what I need to do um so I studied English in college and after that I really got tried to get immersed in the writing scene in Dublin here and as usual with with me, uh, I'm always a little bit behind other people, but I am really working towards um, trying to get stuff published now and stuff mm -hmm. actually finished. But yeah, the first uh, story that I had published was due to my my booktube channel. It was in the the served cold one. I think did yeah. you had a story in that as well. Um, I did, so yeah. And I was gonna I was gonna ask you about your your served cold story and what you could tell us about it. Yeah, so that was. That was such a, a great opportunity to be able to um, say that I now have a published story, and that's, that was really cool. Um, that was actually a story that I struggled with for a long time because I I was trying to present it to my writing group, who are mostly um, uh, literary fiction writers, and mm -hmm. I was trying to present it like a, a literary fiction story, and I just, no matter what I did with it, I just couldn't get it to work. And so I thought, okay, I'm, I'm just going to try and write it like my way. So I added in a, a ghost, a supernatural element, and I was finally able to finish it. Um, and it was sort of originally based off um, the idea that I'm from Donegal, which is at the north of Ireland, and I've moved mm -hmm. down to Dublin. And I realized uh, that there's a lot of colloquial language and words that we use up there that I've almost forgotten just because I'm not there so much so there's a few of those in the story and it's it's about someone sort of returning home and the sort of remembering things that you didn't even realize you had forgotten and uh, I thought I'd add in a classic woman in white ghost mm -hmm. uh, which I think is pretty prevalent in a lot of cultures actually uh, now that I've been thinking about it um but yeah that one was a, a fun one to write and I'm, I'm really glad that was my my first to be published awesome and are you working on you know have you got any works in progress at the moment yes um I'm actually hoping in the next month or two to have a novella out um and I have some longer uh novels on the back burner as well so I'm really hoping to uh get the ball rolling on those and get some books out and uh, hopefully a novel next year. Um, and they'll all hopefully be in the, the horror thriller kind of genre. Cause that's, that's kind of my thing. Yeah. 
Awesome. Um, well, one of the questions I wanted to ask is like, how important do you think it is uh, for an author to read widely? And I guess, you know, is it important? So again, let's say if you're only staying in horror, you know, can you get away with only reading horror novels? Or do you think there's something to be said for reading across a range of genres? Um, I think it, it does depend on the person. But for me, personally, I, I love um so many different genres I love reading fantasy and sci-fi and literary fiction and I love novellas short stories so and I think a lot of my story ideas do come from the more uh realistic like literary fiction kind of stories and like I can add in sort of supernatural or horror elements but the core of them is like this the deep seed of like humanity and our relationships to one another and like the darkness that can lurk in there. So I think, I think if anyone is intentionally sort of narrowing their focus, I think they can be losing out on a lot of um, other opportunities to find inspiration and stuff because you can, you can find inspiration anywhere. And I yeah. definitely do find inspiration in, in reading widely and reading lots of different genres. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. I'm here in conversation with horror author Gloria McNeely. And this is Esther Hayes with Black and Blue. How do you hide a bruise? It's under your skin, but constantly pushing through. Please tell me how to close off your heart when it's been beaten and torn apart. When is the time right to say I'm through? There's no point crying. Nothing to do Like a mirror shattered And no longer have A clear view Of you And I am always turning And I am always turning Black and blue
That was Esther Hayes with Black and Blue. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. And it's time for me to be rejoined now in conversation by this week's guest, who is a horror author, Gloria McNeely. And what would you say, like, what what makes for a good story? At least in, I guess it is quite subjective, but but kind of in your eyes, what what do you think makes for a good story? That is a good question. Um, (laughs) I think for me, it's just... being able to connect with the characters and that is one of the struggles especially with short stories because you have such a limited time to do that but when it's done well you can really notice it like you can really tell how much you actually care about these people whether they're good bad in between and the actual outcome because if if you're not really connected to the characters what happens doesn't really matter it can be interesting but I think like we as people we need to to connect to the people in the story in some way so for me the people uh is is generally the the cornerstone of any story that I read I need to be able to feel something at least even if it's anger or hatred or whatever Mm -hmm yeah no i can relate to that i mean that's put me in mind of uh there's a james herbert book i think it was it was called like 48 or something it was it was a year anyway um and uh that that like it starts with this guy running from nazis basically and it's like you know obviously we know nazis are bad but i also didn't know who this character was it literally threw you straight in with this action scene and it wasn't until about chapter two chapter three when you start to get to know the character where i sort of fell into the story because it was it was kind of like just observing this stuff happening but it's like but i don't know what you know for all i know this guy could be even worse than the nazis or he could be one of them so um yeah i I think you're right It, it helps to to be able to relate to the character and to see them as as human yeah that definitely i think that definitely has put me off a lot of books and a lot of stories where they try and get into the action a little too soon and yeah uh, like there are some good writers who can sort of meld them together and give you enough information to to sort of get into the action but also know a little bit about the characters but sometimes yeah it can be a little off-putting to just have stuff happening and not knowing where you're supposed to stand on it yeah yeah for sure cool okay so something else i wanted to ask you about is uh so you you offer beta reading and i wondered if you could explain what beta reading is and why should people hire you to do it uh yes um this is something i i just recently got into um but it's working out really well for me so the beta reading that i offer or beta reading in general is just having someone give uh, a second set of eyes to your story or your novel and to tell you, it can be either specific questions from the writer or just a general idea of what works within the story, what doesn't work, if there's information missing or if there are scenes that are dragging the the pace down, slowing everything down, Um, just give general advice like that. Um, I think what sets me a little bit apart is that I'm also a writer so I'm not just looking at it from a a reader's perspective of Mm -hmm. enjoying the the story but I can also give um sort of concrete directions at least um on how to fix certain things um especially if the the writer themselves themselves says that they struggle with dialogue or they struggle with action scenes um I can give pointers uh on how they can possibly improve those or, you know, bring up the pacing or include a character or get rid of a character that isn't uh, serving the story in any way. So um, I've gotten a lot of good feedback so far Mm -hmm. um, from people who who find it really valuable and it's something I really enjoy doing as well. So it was a a good find for me. I, I had no idea that it was a thing that I could possibly do and actually get paid for but now i'm like really happy with it so yeah well and i had a look at some of the reviews and and yeah i I, you know they've all been really sort of overwhelmingly positive and i I think that's something that a few of the people have picked up on is that you you can go above and beyond you know you don't just say this is this is why it's broken you say this is how you can fix it uh which again comes i think comes from having that that author authorial take on it 
Um, and I wanted to ask as well, like, how do you go about delivering feedback that maybe the, you know the author isn't going to want to hear? So let's let's say it is actually you should cut this character, but you know you can tell it's their favorite character. It just isn't right for the story. How how do you deliver feedback like that? Yeah, so surprisingly, I was a little worried about that in the beginning, but so far, um, like people are are quite open to hearing feedback like that. Um, I obviously try and uh, be as diplomatic as I can mm. and not be too um, overt in those things. But um, I think if if I can frame it in a way that explains to them exactly why it's it may be hurting the story um i think they're really receptive to that but i think it's also important to know that you know they don't have to take any of my yeah. actual advice um like if they're it's their writing if they want to keep something if they don't want to change something then that's that's totally up to them i'm just giving them my my perspective and even if they decided to to keep a character that i thought wasn't um wasn't serving the story you know it might at least point them in the direction of changing changing mm -hmm. some things um and i think even with you know if i was the second or third person or if they they had some other feedback that was similar to mine that might um convince them that it would be better to to cut a scene or a, a storyline yeah. or whatever yeah so, well uh I was going to say probably quite often your your job is to actually tell them the things that they they know but they don't want to admit to themselves. Yeah, it's it's either they don't want to admit to themselves or they know that something isn't quite right and I've had this yeah. myself in my own writing you can tell it's not quite working but you're not sure exactly how and you feel like you're hitting all the points but it's still not running smoothly. Um, I think one of the most difficult things for me, though, is when I get a story, especially like a novel, and it's pretty much perfect. Yeah. And I, I basically just have to tell them how much I loved everything, and I, yeah. I, I can't, you know, give them any feedback on that. But even then, um, a lot of those writers are just thankful that someone is able to articulate why. And, mm. and they can actually believe it rather than just having people say, yeah, it was great, you know, publish yeah. it. So they're still grateful for that. Awesome. Cool. Um, okay. A couple of fun questions for you here. So who are some of the authors you'd most like to uh, do beta reading for? Ooh. Um, current writers, I think Catrion Award is one. I like her stories. Um, again, Sophie White, I'd, I'd read anything that she wrote. Um, Deirdre Sullivan is another, um, Irish writer who's done some really cool, like fantasy horror, um, YA books. And I like Neil Gaiman as well. Mm -hmm. I think he's, he'd be a pretty cool guy. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Okay. And, um, so, you, obviously, you've talked a little bit about Dublin. Uh, what are some of the bookshops and or literary sort of haunts that you recommend people to visit if they visit Dublin? Oh, yeah. Um, so I spent a lot of time. One of the reasons that I'm even in it at all is um, the Irish Writers' Centre, which is um, a cent it's a charity organization, but they put on loads of writing events and writing courses and stuff and writing seminars and they have they have a great website and they have so many opportunities for writers in Ireland and outside of Ireland. They have a lot of competitions and stuff as well. Um, some of my favorite bookshops would definitely be uh, the Gutter Bookshop, which is an independent bookshop. Um, they're great supporters of the Irish writing scene. Mm -hmm. um, Hodges Figgis is, I think, one of the oldest bookshops in Dublin. Um, there's always great uh, book events and book launches in there, and it's a fantastic uh, building, great to hang around in. Um, I think Chapters is also one of the oldest. It almost shut down, but um, we thankfully were able to to bring it back. So it's a one of the biggest bookshops and um, has a great selection of so many different genres and uh, secondhand books as well. So there's there's quite a few um, 
great bookshops in Dublin that uh, I spend too much money in. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Okay. And uh, just the last question, and we kind of touched on it a little bit, but but what's next for you? And where can people follow you to stay up to date? Um, yeah, so I, I have a booktube channel, um, Gloria McNeely Writer. Uh, my Instagram and my TikTok are also Gloria McNeely Writer as well. I have a, a book writing related TikTok as well. Um, I'll be posting regularly about my my journey to publishing there. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, next up for me is hopefully getting a couple of uh, short story books and a couple of novellas published and We'll see how it goes from there. Big thank you to Gloria McNeely for joining me. You're listening to the Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is Burt Honor with Dismantling. Sits the wise old man, a guardian of decency in the world gone mad. He sees the boy men racing by, imaginary garlands round their heads, endless words dripping from their lips. They don't hear him say. See this bundle of sticks It's strong because of its mix And don't they break us like twigs Don't untie See this bundle of sticks It's strong because of its mix And don't they break us like twigs Don't untie They're soaring eagles aim on high the wise old man is on the ground From the flight across the sky They never hear the wisdom in his words See this bundle of sticks is strong because of its mix Alone they break just like twigs don't untie See this bundle of sticks is strong because of its mix Alone they break just like twigs don't untie Because of its mix, alone they break 
That was Bundle of Sticks by Waterfall, and before that we had Dismantling by Burt Honor. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and it's time for us to head over to the Elk Shed now to catch up with Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review. Paul Robeson, the best of Paul Robeson. I found this LP in the Sue Ryder charity shop in High Wickham. I actually bought two Paul Robeson LPs, but this is the one with Old Man River on it. Old Man River comes from the musical Showboat. It was the first musical that was based on a serious story. And that story, rather controversially for the time, had an anti-discrimination message. It has the famous miscegenation scene, where two lovers are not allowed to marry because one is mixed race. They famously overcome this injustice with a clever trick. Old Man River is Paul Robeson's most famous song. He sings it in the original 1936 film. It is a clip I used to see a lot on TV when I was a kid. He sings with a deep, dark, resonant bass voice. The problem with listening to Paul Robeson on vinyl, with the volume turned up, is the distraction of stuff vibrating in unison with his voice, even the floor. But it gets you in the pit of the stomach. This album also has other show tunes and spirituals. But Paul Robeson was not just a singer, but an athlete, an actor, an activist and a lawyer. He was a socialist activist and while performing in England was friends with H.G. Wells and George Bernard Shaw. He sang songs of peace in many languages and supported unions and campaigned for workers' rights all over the world. He was blacklisted in the McCarthy era and was not allowed to travel, so he performed over the telephone lines to audiences in London and Wales. The concerts were titled Let Robeson Sing. The Manic Street Preachers wrote a song about it, probably one of their best. The best of Paul Robeson. Big thank you to Twangle Jack Ford for this week's album review. Thanks to Gloria McNeely for being this week's guest. Thank you to A.B. Frank for his short fiction. Thank you to everyone whose music I've shared. As always, you can reach out to me here at the studio by dropping me a line on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. I'm particularly keen to hear from poets, performers, musicians, people with MP3s to share and local arts news. Don't hesitate to get in touch. You can also find us on Facebook. If you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. And we are repeating on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again, iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Please do leave us a short review on your podcast platform of choice. So that's about it for another show. I'm going to leave you with one last tune, and this is Superlord with Wait. I'll catch you next week. <laughs> <laughs>